Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Wonderful weather outside after a stormy day. We have sunshine, so praise the Lord. The, the book of Psalms in 106, chapter 106 says, Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercies endureth forever. And uh, this is the weekend that we are reminding again, reminded about uh, being thankful to God, the Thanksgiving weekend. Let's, um, let's just stand and let's start praying, praising God with the first song, Forever. glad to come together in the house of the Lord to worship the risen Savior this morning because that is what it's all about. It's lifting high the name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, our Savior Jesus Christ who is alive. Amen? Amen? Forevermore. I just have a couple of announcements this morning. This is the last Sunday to sign up for the poinsettias. So if you haven't purchased one and you would like to, uh, please stop by the connection desk and uh, sign up to purchase one uh, there. Also, we will be having our Regular schedule of services tonight, starting at 6 o'clock with our Bible studies for children, youth, and adults. Also, at 5 o'clock, we are having our practice, our first practice for the youth and children's uh, Christmas program. So, be out here at 5 o'clock for that, young folks. So, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you so very much. We thank you so much you've allowed us to gather together as brothers and sisters, Lord, as the family of God, and to worship you today. Father, we pray that you would help us to guard our thoughts, Lord, to be focused upon you, not to be distracted by anything else, Lord, but just to fully fixate upon worshiping you today, Lord. And may we be more concerned about our, our worship being pleasing to you than what we would get out of anything, Father. So, Father, we just want to magnify your name today and lift high the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing and let's continue to worship God. We we'll worship the King.
Jesus Messiah. And let's just sing from the bottom of our hearts. I think you're just a tad. He became sin. He knew no sin. Yes.
please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time again, Father. We just, uh, we thank you so much for your continued provisions and blessings on us. Father, we thank you for the opportunities to, uh, to serve you throughout the week, Father. And we thank you for the ministries you've given us through our labor. Father, we thank you for uh, what we've earned through our labor, Father. We know it's all yours. And at this time, as we come to give you a small portion back, Father, we just pray that your blessing would be on it and that it would go forth to glorify your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Please uh, take a seat, and, but let's sing together. This is a great song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and I'm sure everyone knows this song. Thank you so much, Sergey and Sharon. We appreciate you all greatly. Thank you, guys. So this morning, this morning we will be looking at a passage from the book of First Peter. First Peter, as I tell the youth so often, if you're having trouble finding it, it's located conveniently just before Second Peter. So to help you out a little bit there. But 1 Peter, 1 Peter was written to encourage persecuted Christians. And it's important that we understand where Peter is coming from at the beginning of this. You see, they are encouraged, the Christians at that time, to stand fast in the face of difficulty and for them to understand that because Christ suffered, they need to know that they will suffer also. And that is no different than us today as well. If you follow Christ, there will be persecution. You're promised of that. Now, this is very interesting to think back to who is telling the church this. Because it's Peter. Jog your memory a little bit and think back about Peter encouraging people to stand firm when facing suffering and persecution. R.C. Sproul 
points out that it is a tribute to God's great grace that the apostle who once rebuked Jesus over Jesus saying that he had to suffer, the apostle who three times fiercely denied identification with Christ would be the one to deliver the message to the persecuted church about standing fast in the face of persecution. And I'd never thought about that, but it is. Here is Peter. What a transformation. It truly is a measure of God's grace that Peter is the one telling them to stand firm when things get hard. So now, even though we are not under persecution or suffering as the same as the audience that Peter wrote this to, Peter lays out some principal Christian duties or characteristics that all Christians and all churches should have. So even though he is specifically talking to the persecuted church, this, this can apply to us as well. So we will be looking at, the, at these this morning with a goal of continually growing in our love for each other and continually growing in our unity in Christ Jesus. Two things that are absolutely vital for a healthy church. We must have unity and we must be growing in our love for our Savior, each other, and for the lost. So please turn, if you haven't already, in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. Be looking at verses 8 through 12 this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Once you've found it, please stand as you're able in honor of the reading of God's word. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whosoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Let us pray. Father God, you are so kind and so loving. And we thank you so much for giving us the gift of your word, Father. Lord, we pray that you will use your word this morning through your Holy Spirit to transform our lives, Lord. Make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. And this we ask in his name, amen. You may be seated. So as mentioned, Peter thus far in this letter has been laying out the principal Christian duties and obligations from about verse 13 of chapter one on. He's covered numerous areas in, in this time. He's, he's mentioned husbands to wives, wives to husbands, servants to masters, citizens to authority. He's covered all of these things so far. Because you see, there are certain topics that are specific to certain people. And Peter has been addressing that. But you see, now Peter is addressing everyone together. And he's giving us instructions that applies to all Christians. Not just husbands, wives, servants, masters, citizens, and authority. But how do we know this? Well, we know this fairly easily because, well, he tells us. Look here, he says, finally, all of you. So he's done talking to the individual points and now he's talking to everyone as a whole. And so we can all get this today. So what we are looking at this morning is instruction for all believers regardless of their situation. If they're going through a hard time, if they're going through a good time, if they're having a, a rough marriage, if they're having a rough job, if they're facing persecution, whatever the situation is that they're going through, Peter's talking to you. Peter is talking to everyone. So Peter goes on to give us five characteristics of life that brings blessing, or as some have put it, five virtues that bless. Both of these are correct. Both of these are right. And by obeying these and displaying these, this is uh, causing both of us uh, to be blessed of the Lord and others to be blessed 
through our obedience by displaying these virtues. So we are blessed of God to bless others. And when we bless others, we are blessed of God again. And I want us to remember that through this. We are given gifts to use for God's glory. We are told to be a certain way towards our fellow believers and towards people in general. And when we do so, it blesses them. But also we're being obedient to God. And when we're obedient to God, God will bless us all over again. So it's a beautiful cycle of obedience. So the first word we'll look at here is unity of mind from verse 8. Unity of mind. This is like-mindedness, if you will. That is unity in belief. Unity in belief. Those who await the coming of the Lord, serve each other in love, and hope in Christ. We have these in common, and that is the, the unity of mind. Now, in order to possess this, it must be throughout the entire church. You cannot have certain factions when it comes to Christian doctrine. You have to be right. Sam just preached through the book of 1 John and they were addressing that, that so many in that time were coming up with false doctrines and it had to be addressed because they didn't have unity. That's what John had to address the situation. So Peter here is saying, the first thing you need to do is have unity of mind. Now this doesn't mean that there won't be disagreements among church members and amongst Christians but rather that we will be like-minded in our primary Christian doctrines and seeking the will of the Lord and to glorify him together. That's what it means when Peter is telling them and telling us of unity of mind. And these next four virtues all contribute to this one of unity of mind or like-mindedness. The next Peter speaks of here is sympathy. What Peter means by sympathy in this verse, is explained very well by the Apostle Paul. In Romans 12, 15, when he says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Again, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, If one member suffers, all suffer together. If, on one, member, if one member is honored, all rejoice together. That is the sympathy that we should have with our brothers and sisters. And this is not a mere seeking good for another. Okay, it's not a mere seeking good for another. But what this goes deeper, it's, it's rather entering into others' needs and concerns. Entering into others' needs and concerns. We ought to have that love for our fellow believers that when they hurt, we hurt. When they rejoice, we rejoice. As Paul said, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. But how often is this neglected? And the reason it's neglected is because it takes time and effort to do that, folks. It takes time and effort to, to step into someone else's world when they're hurting, when they're weeping. It takes time and effort to do that. But so many times we are content with just saying, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. And don't get me wrong. We, we covet the prayers of our brothers and sisters for us. We all do. But you see, sympathy demands more when you're a Christian. It demands more. It demands stepping in to where they are. Just as if one person in your household suffers loss, you all feel it. Or if one person is honored, everyone goes to see them receive that honor. How much more in the household of God should we enter into the needs and concerns of our brothers and sisters? And that's the example that we should follow. But ultimately, the reason we are to sympathize with our brothers and sisters is because of Christ. The example that he set, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see, Christ steps into our world. Christ is sympathetic towards us. That should be the example we follow, to be sympathetic towards others. And we must take the necessary time and effort to sympathize with our fellow believers. 
It takes effort. It takes going out of your way. It takes making yourself uncomfortable at times to sympathize with others. But is that not what Christ did for us? The third item Peter mentions here is brotherly love. Brotherly love. Now, you hear brotherly love a lot, a lot, but this is truly a Christian trait. Brotherly love is a Christian trait. It is used in everyday vernacular as friendship or close friendship. And that's just kind of where we keep it. We kind of tap it off there. Yet this term is, Christ, is a Christian term because it denotes the new birth. It denotes the new birth. It represents the fact that we have been born again by the spirit of the living God through faith in the redeeming work of Christ Jesus as decreed by God the Father. You see, not everyone can have brotherly love. You see, we are adopted into the family of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And thus we have the same father, meaning we are family. We are brothers and we are sisters. And some of you are thinking right now, you mean I'm going to be stuck with that guy for eternity? Yes. Yes, you are. You're welcome. But we are family. 1 John 3.14, John wrote, We know that we have passed out of death to life because we love the brothers. Our Lord Jesus in John 13.35 said, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This love is special. It's not just an everyday, ordinary love that Christians have for each other. Because we are bound together in a way that the lost can never experience without being transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ themselves. It's a love that isn't content with speaking to someone once a week or just on Sunday mornings or seeing them only on Sunday mornings. It's a love that desires to be together because of the love of Christ. Do you miss your brothers and sisters when you're not with them? I think you do. I know I do. Take time this morning before you leave. Because, you know, we all have our spots. And Kelly and I were quite uncomfortable. We changed our spot this morning. So pray for us, okay? But we all have our spots that we sit, okay? And you know who sits around you. Take time each Sunday and look around. See who's not there and reach out to them. Let them know that you loved them. Let them know that you miss them. Because we do miss each other. We do miss each other. The church is to be unified, loving, and caring toward all. Yes, there's no doubt about it. We are to be loving and caring towards all. But especially, and listen brothers and sisters, especially to the church. Especially to God's people. As Paul said in Galatians 6.10, when speaking on how we are to bear one another's burdens, he said, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith, especially to your brothers and sisters. We're to love everyone, but especially the family of God. You're to be, have a special love for them. And this is not a foreign concept. Everyone in here who is a parent has dealt with this. Every parent loves children. Love children, period. If you're a parent, you've had kids, you love children, okay? Children are great. But there is a special love for those children that are your own. It's not that you don't love the others, but it's that it's a special love because they're yours, Brothers and sisters, look around. It's okay to love the people in the world. We're told to love them. But this is a special love. This is a special group of people that is redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are all adopted into the family of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we should love each other in a special way because we are each other's. We are family. Likewise, we show love to all people but a special love to those who are part of the family of God. The fourth virtue that Peter mentions here in verse 8 is a tender heart. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, 
a tender heart. Now, this term that's used for tender heart here has its root in a reference to inner organs or feelings. Okay? And as strange as that sounds, we think the same way today. We think the same way today. Let me explain. You see, we use the term heart when we're referring, referring to feelings, don't we? We use the term heart. The Greeks associated inner organs with courage, which is where we get the saying that someone who does something extraordinarily brave has what? They got guts. They've got intestinal fortitude, right? We do the same thing today. We say that it, it refers to those inner, inner organs. In the Old Testament, inner organs were linked with mercy and concern. They were linked with mercy and concern. An example of this is seen in Isaiah 63, 15, where Isaiah wrote, Look down from heaven and see from your holy, beautiful habitation, where are your zeal and your might, the stirring of your inward parts and your compassion are held back from me. Is he talking about that God has an upset stomach? Of course not. He's talking about feelings and emotion and compassion. We see it today. Right? Yesterday was Kelly's my 17th anniversary. And you know what? I still get butterflies. Right? She paid me to say that, by the way. Put that in here. But no, I still get butterflies when I'm around her. Why? That's what it's talking about. Those feelings, right? That tender heartedness, the feelings, your emotions. So tender hearted encompasses your emotions and your feelings. So this is compassion. And once again, the reason we are told to be tender hearted is because of the example Jesus Christ set for us. He had compassion upon everyone he encountered. Everyone he encountered. In Matthew 9, 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And again, in Matthew 14, 14, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion on them and healed their sick. Matthew 15, 32, then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And we see this over and over again. Matthew 20, 34, Mark 1, 41, Mark 6, 34, Mark 8, 2, Luke 7, 13. We could go on and on and on with examples of compassion that Jesus had for his fellow man. Peter also tells of Christ's tender heart and compassion for us in the same book in chapter 2, verse 24, when he said, He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Again, in chapter 3, verse 18, Peter says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. What compassion Jesus Christ has for people, and especially for his own. So we ought to be tender hearted toward each other as followers of Christ. It's a command, always showing compassion. However, here's the rub, brothers and sisters. Christ showed disdain and condescension toward the lost sheep of Israel, didn't he? No, no. Christ looked at them with compassion. He understood their condition, their spiritual deadness, their being bound to sin with no hope of freedom apart from the work of the Lord. That is how he viewed the lost. Just as Peter is saying, we are to have compassion, be tenderhearted toward one another, we have to be that way for the lost. We have to see them in their lostness. We have to let our heart break for the lost, be tenderhearted for them. 
Is this how we view the lost? Is this how we view the sinner? No matter the sin, you know? No matter the sin. Christ wasn't, wasn't like, well, as long as they, well, as long as they have only committed a tier one or a tier two sin, then I'll have compassion on them. But if they've entered into the realm of tier two, tier three, and tier four sin, whoa, I'm going to cut the compassion off. No. Those who are lost, shouldn't we also be that way even more toward those who are part of the family? What I mean by this is when a brother or sister in Christ has stumbled into sin, the sin which so, so closely clings, as the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12, verse 1, or I love how the, uh, the NIV puts it, the sin which so easily ensnares us, you see, we like to think of, oh, them sinning. But you know what? The Bible says sin easily ensnares all of us. Raise your hand if you didn't sin last week. If you raise your hand, congratulations, you just lied and got a head start on this week. <laughs> you see, sin easily ensnares all of us. So we are to have compassion on our brother or our sister when they stumble into sin. God's word lays out specific ways that we are to approach them with the desired re result being repentance and restoration. But we are to have compassion upon them. The last virtue Peter lists here in verse 8 is humble-minded, being humble-minded. This corresponds to the first virtue or trait. That being unity of mind. This corresponds perfectly with it. If we are honest with ourselves, most fights and disagreements start from our desire to have our way over another person. I don't believe there's a single fight that has ever resulted from anything other than that. We desire to have our way over another person. So it's easy to see how being humble-minded fosters unity of mind. Because in order to be humble, you have to put others above yourself. You have to think of others more highly than you think of yourself. The Lord Jesus, once again, is the perfect example of this. In Philippians 2, 5 through 7, Paul wrote, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Talking about humility, humility of mind. If we go back just a few verses in the same passage in Philippians, Paul sums up all five of these principal Christian duties that Peter lays out here in this verse. He says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility 
Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. That's exactly what Peter was speaking about here in this passage. With unity, like-mindedness, sympathy, brotherly love, tenderheartedness, and a humble mind, they're all found right here in Paul's words in Philippians. Let's look at verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to you, this you are called, that you may obtain a blessing. You see, it's a great thing that our blessings, our blessing of others cannot be stopped by hatred. Our blessing of others cannot be stopped by hatred. When you're cursed, bless. That's what we're told to do. But you see, this flies in the face of our human nature. This flies in the face. Our human nature says, if you hit me, I'm going to hit you back harder. That's what our human nature says. But Peter, uh, Peter explains this earlier in 2.23, once again with an example of Christ. He says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. This command is true whether interacting with the world or a believer. This is how we are to conduct ourselves. There is no such thing as Christian retaliation. It should not exist. I came across a great explanation of this. It says, to return evil for good is animal-like. To return evil for evil is human-like. But to return good for evil is God-like. That's what we should strive for. When we are wronged, when we are cursed, bless. Quickly, let's read verses 10 through 12. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him speak peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. These final three verses are a quotation from Psalm 34. Psalm 34 verses 12 through 16. These verses support what we have been told in verse 9. That those who don't seek revenge but instead bless those who do wrong against them will receive blessing in return. Remember we talked about that earlier? We are blessed of God, therefore we bless others. And when we bless others, what happens? God blesses us again. But do we bless others like we should? Do you know why we have to have unity of mind, sympathy toward others, show brotherly love toward each other, compassion toward each other, and have a humble mind and bless those who do evil against us? We do it because God blessed us first. We do all that we do because of him. We love him because he first loved us. Psalm 32, 1 through 2 says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. We bless others in the name of Jesus Christ, who through his blood removed our sins from us. We were helpless and without hope. But then Jesus, right? But then Jesus that's our story. We were helpless and without hope, but then Jesus stepped onto the scene in our lives. So we who are blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, as Paul says in Ephesians 1.3, how can we not bless others in the way Christ has blessed us? We are blessed by God for one reason, to bless others. We are blessed to bless others. 
I think of the 23rd Psalm when David writes, My cup runneth over. What are we to do with that extra? Waste it? No. Pour it into one of our brother and sister's lives. We are blessed, so we have to bless in return. Now, if we're not living this way, if we are not demonstrating in our lives these virtues laid out by Peter here, then we're sinning. You may not be doing an act that's sinful, but not doing what you're supposed to is sinning as well. James 4.17 reminds us that whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it's sin. Neglect and omission are no excuse to God. Well, you know, somebody did something to me. I'm just not going to be kind to them. I'm not going to return mean to them, but I'm not going to be kind to them. It's not what God says. You're sinning. He says, bless. So in just a few moments, we are going to partake in the elements of communion. And I want us to think for just a moment. I want us to think for a moment. Is there sin in our life? Is there sin in our life? Is there sin that we haven't dealt with, that we haven't confessed to God, that we haven't repented of? Because if we are honest, as long as we are still in our sinful flesh, there will be a war waging within us. And there are days, there are times that we will stumble. So brothers and sisters, right now we need to take the time to let the Holy Spirit search our hearts. To dig deep, to dredge up any sin that has settled in our heart and has become normal. Let him dredge that up to the surface. Something you've done or something you've, you've not done like maybe not forgiving someone, whatever it is, deal with that sin right now, right where you're sitting. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not just some unrighteousness, not just tier one or tier twos, even tier three or tier four sins. And remember, 1 John was written to Christians. The Bible is written to and for believers. It's foolishness to those who don't believe. So when John tells us to confess our sins and receive that cleansing, he's talking to you, he's talking to me, brother and sister. No matter the sin, the cross of Christ rises above it. Or perhaps this morning, you're realizing that you are dead in your trespasses and sin. And your pride has been keeping you from trusting Christ as your Savior. Because you grew up in the church. You're on a church roll. You might teach Sunday school. You might be a deacon. Whatever. You guys understand that there are people who have been to church for 30, 40 years been a member, and then finally come to Christ. They thought they had it, and finally they realized they didn't. Search your heart this morning. Whether you got saved in the 50s or 60s, or you got saved last week, search your heart this morning and see if there be any sin within you. In just a moment, we're going to have our time of invitation. And during that time of invitation, I want to invite you to do business with God this morning. You don't have to come forward. Do business right where you are. There's nothing special about walking an aisle. You do business with the Lord right where you are. But I want to let you know that I will be here. A couple of deacons will be here. A couple of ladies will be here. We would be glad to speak with you and pray with you about the decision that you're making. Or maybe the Holy Spirit's dredging up a sin in your life that you have been struggling with. 
I would count it an honor to, to talk to you about that and pray with you about that. And help you as best we can in your, in your battle with that. Because you know the Bible says we are to confess our sins one to another. It shouldn't, we should not be surprised if a brother or sister sins because we still struggle with it. But we need to be there for them. Whatever you're dealing with today, will you make a decision for the Lord? Whether it's repentance and turning back to Him from a sin you've been struggling with, brother or sister, or maybe it's turning to Christ for the first time, whatever it is, you make your decision right now. Also, this is the appropriate time. If you've been wrestling with joining our body of believers here at First Baptist Weddington, now is the time. We would love to have you join us. Worship the Lord and serve the Lord together with us here at First Baptist Church Weddington. If that's the decision you're making, come forward as well. Whatever the Lord is pricking you with in your heart right now, won't you respond? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you've given us your word, that you have given us your word that tells us how to live as Christians. Things that we are to cultivate in our lives, Lord, to bring honor and glory to you. And Father, also to bless those around us, particularly those of the household of faith, but also to the world. Father, I pray you will help us to foster unity of mind, brotherly love, tenderheartedness, compassion, that you would help us to seek after these things. That we would not seek revenge when someone wrongs us, Lord, but we would forgive them and seek restoration and have compassion and sympathy for them. And Father, I do pray and plead with you this morning, Lord, if there is someone in the sound of my voice right now that does not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, that right now you would call them to your kingdom, please, Lord. That you would call them to saving faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, if one of my brothers and sisters is here and they have been struggling with the sin all alone, Father, propel them forward to know that they don't have to be alone because they have a family of believers who are here for them. Have your way in our hearts. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. That is the place where mercy lives and never dies. That is the place where streams of just a moment we are going to have our communion. We are going to break bread together in remembrance of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. But first, as I just mentioned a moment ago, I want us to take time and search our hearts 
If there is any sin that we need to confess to the Lord before we approach his table, I'm going to give us a few moments of just silent prayer for all of us to confess any sin to the Lord. Amen. We ask our deacons if they would come forward for the distribution of the elements. And if you are a Christian, you are invited to partake in the elements. But if you are not a believer, we would simply ask that you would pass the elements on down. Jesus gave us the command to remember him. And we are to do this until he returns to us again. He said, this is my body that's broken for you. Eat.
After they ate the bread, Christ took the cup, said, this is my blood that is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Amen. Praise God for His presence and uh, speaking to our hearts this morning. Let's uh, just stand and uh, conclude the service with this song. Praise you, and I hope that uh, each heart wants to praise God this morning. So praise you. Thank you.